Dead America, El Paso, Creeping Death Part 1 Dead America, The Second Month Written by Derek Slayton Narrated by Aaron Smith Prologue The first month of the Texas zombie virus was a difficult one for the survivors. The pandemic raged across the country, infecting anyone with A-type blood and turning them into flesh-hungry undead. Meanwhile, the Rivas cartel launched their invasion into the United States. Ten thousand heavily armed stormed across the border, slaughtering anyone deemed a threat, and enslaving those who were seen as useful. The police force in El Paso didn't stand a chance, and quickly became overwhelmed, ceding control of the city to the violent drug cartel. A fortunate few managed to escape to the town of Fabens, several miles to the east of El Paso, aided by Rodriguez, the right-hand man of Tiago Rivas, the head of the cartel. These survivors created a safe haven for themselves. Through a series of dangerous excursions to the surrounding towns in search of goods for Tiago, they managed to create an uneasy coexistence with the cartel. As long as they were able to keep providing them with useful things they wanted, such as high-end alcohol, Fabens was safe for another day. Led by former homicide detective Rogers and former military intelligence officer Leon, the survivors in town had taken an active role in fighting back against their oppressors. Four rogue soldiers, led by Sergeant Hammond, led a daring operation to assassinate Tiago Rivas and take down the cartel once and for all. While they managed to wound him, they did not succeed in eliminating him. This failure resulted in their self-imposed exile from the town. In order to protect the others that remained from getting blamed for the assassination attempt, the soldiers took up residence a hundred miles to the east, on the other side of Fort Stockton, hunkering down with a handful of new allies. As the second month in this new world begins, the survivors' struggles are far from over. Chapter 1 The sun peeked over the horizon as Whittaker knelt beside the large generator that ran the makeshift house they were staying in. Landry and Jeff stood beside a small box of tools, watching her intently. Screwdriver, Whittaker said, holding out her hand. Landry cocked his head. Phillips or Flathead? he asked. Flat, she replied. He fished out the proper screwdriver from the box and stuck it in her awaiting palm. She took it and rattled around in the generator for a moment. Okay, try it now, she said, sitting back. Landry motioned to Jeff, who reached down and grabbed the pull starter. He gave it a good yank, and the engine sputtered a moment before cutting out. He took a deep breath to try again, but Whittaker raised a hand to stop him. Hang tight, she said. I see the problem. She fiddled around with the motor for another moment before giving it a good smack with the handle of the screwdriver. She got to her feet, waving Jeff out of the way, and then grabbed the pull chain and gave it a hard rip. The generator rumbled loudly to life, purring happily. Guess we can start adding some DVDs to the shopping list whenever we go out, Jeff declared, nodding appreciatively. Whittaker reached down and flipped the power off. We're going to need to find a good fuel source before we start wasting it on movies, she replied, shaking her head. We're in November. At least, I think we're in November. Who the hell can tell anymore? Regardless, it's going to be getting cold soon and we're going to need heat. Not sure where we're getting it at, Landry replied thoughtfully. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm in no hurry to go back into Fort Stockton. Whittaker shrugged. Guess we're headed east, then, she said. I mean, if we want this thing up and running, that is. Hope you're ready for a drive, then, Jeff said, stretching his arms above his head. Because there ain't a goddamn thing for miles. Landry shrugged. Can't be that bad, he said. So what if we have to drive ten, twenty miles to hit a station? Jeff shook his head. Try sixty or seventy, he explained. Minimum. Landry sighed, his shoulders sagging. This is going to be a long-ass day, isn't it? He whined. What? Did you have other plans? 
Whittaker teased, smacking him on the shoulder. Landry cleared his throat, pretending to pull an imaginary list from his back pocket and thumb through it. Oh, let's see, huh? he said as he checked his invisible schedule. Ah, here we go. Sit on my ass, have a bit of lunch, sit on my ass some more, and if time permits, throw some smaller rocks at larger ones in the distance. Wow, Whittaker gasped, putting a hand to her chest. Four whole things. Landry cocked a brow. You sound impressed, he said. I am, she quipped. I had no idea you could count that high. She waved for the two men to follow her as they shared a laugh. Come on, let's go see who's coming with us. They walked away from the generator and up the stairs to the makeshift apartment. As they entered, Sparks and Rufus waved at them from the couch. Sergeant Hammond was in the kitchen, the sounds of dishes clanging. Oh, Lord, Sarge is cooking again, Landry said loudly. Whittaker playfully shuddered. I still have nightmares about the last time, she said in horror. Hey, I heard that, Hammond barked from the kitchen. Good, because I can still taste whatever god-awful meat you cooked that night, Whittaker called back. There was a sharp laugh before the clanging continued. So, what's the story on the generator? Rufus asked, sitting forward. Whittaker plopped herself down on the couch opposite him. I got her fixed up, she replied. So she should run smoothly. We just need to stock up on fuel. Let me grab my gun and we'll head out, Rufus said, jerking a thumb over his shoulder. Sparks put a hand on his arm before he could get up. You're not going to wait on breakfast? You heard the lady, he drawled, motioning to Whittaker. Last meal he cooked gave her nightmares. Already had enough of those eating MREs in the jungle. You know I can hear y'all, don't you? Hammond quipped playfully from the kitchen. Rufus sat back against the couch, his cheeks pinking a little with embarrassment as Sparks laughed at his expense. Mary emerged from the bedroom, a haggard-looking Ricky behind her. His arm was in a sling, and he moved a lot slower than her. "'Morning, everyone,' Mary said, but the brightness sounded forced. "'Lo and behold, the dead walk!' Rufus declared, motioning to his injured friend. Ricky gave a half-hearted shrug. Well, I figured everybody else was doing it, and I just wanted to fit in, he joked. Nothing like a little peer pressure to get you off your ass, Jeff said, and laughter rippled through the room. Sparks turned to Ricky. So, how are you feeling? she asked, motioning to his bandaged shoulder. He shrugged his good one, glancing down at the bullet wound that seemed to be now on the mend. I don't know what those drugs were that you were feeding me, but they did the trick, he replied. Not going to be winning any push-up contests any time soon, though. Oh, honey, Mary said, patting his head gently. Let's be honest, you were never going to win any push-up contests anyway. He chuckled, shaking his head. Never let it be said that my better half kicks a man while he's down, he said, raising his good hand. She waits until he staggers to his feet. More laughter erupted throughout the group as the couple found their seats around the coffee table. A moment later, Hammond emerged from the kitchen with a tray full of breakfast sandwiches. Sorry these aren't McDonald's quality, he said as he set them down on the coffee table with a flourish. But hopefully they hit the spot. Whittaker raised an eyebrow. I think we'll settle for not making us violently ill, Sarge she said dryly. Hammond smirked and picked up one of the sandwiches, taking a big bite and making a show of chewing it and swallowing it. The others each took one, his team carefully inspecting them. Landry poked the spam and egg suspiciously, and Whittaker did the same. Hey, Hammond, Landry drawled. Don't mean to seem ungrateful or anything, but uh, where did you find eggs at? I haven't seen a chicken since this thing began. So unless you have a medical condition you haven't shared with the rest of us, I'm a bit concerned. Don't worry, they're powdered eggs, Hammond replied, rolling his eyes. I found a few boxes of them in the back of the truck. Well, that explains the cardboard taste, Rufus said through a mouthful of food. But hey, protein is protein. At least that's what they told us when they were passing out our MREs. Hammond shrugged. 
Well, chefs are only as good as their ingredients, so if you find me something better, I'll gladly whip it up, he replied. Rufus and Sparks each took another bite, and then shared a look that confirmed they both agreed it tasted like cardboard. We'll add it to the shopping list when we head out today, the redhead said. Rufus took a deep breath. Are we really going into Fort Stockton again? he asked. I think we need to head back east, Jeff suggested. I remember seeing a sign for some small shitburg about an hour back. Sparks shrugged. Not a terrible idea, really, she agreed. Should be far enough away from Junction and whatever that other town we stopped over in. And if it's that isolated, it can't be that big, Rufus added. Shouldn't be too many of those things. And if there were, people who escaped there wouldn't have been enough of them to have a run on the gas station. Whittaker nodded, raising a hand. Landry and I can head out after breakfast to stock up on fuel. Rufus and I will tag along as well, Sparks said. Landry cocked a brow. Four of us in the SUV isn't going to leave much room for gas, he said slowly. Guess I'll just have to steal a car then when we get out there, Rufus declared with a shrug. Sparks eyed him playfully. You know I'm a cop, right? Gotta get you to use the handcuffs on me somehow, girl, he replied with a saucy wink. She scoffed and smacked him on the arm, but couldn't keep the goofy smile from her face. If you all are heading out... Ricky piped up. I got something that might help you out. He got up and hobbled into his room, and then emerged after some rummaging carrying a small drone, holding it out to Whittaker. Battery on this should be good. It's got a little view screen there on the controls. Figure you can fly it around whatever small town and do some scouting. Make things a bit safer for y'all. She smiled and took it, nodding gratefully. Thank you, she said sincerely. I'll take good care of it. Landry reached out for the controller, but Whittaker smacked his hand away. I said I was going to take good care of it, she said as she took the controller. You keep your grubby little hands off of it. Landry playfully pouted and crossed his arms. If there aren't too many zombies roaming about, do a quick inventory of the town before heading back, Hammond cut in. If we have a honey hole, we might as well mine it for everything we can. Whittaker nodded. You got it, Sarge. Everyone finished their sandwiches, and Hammond got to his feet. Anybody want seconds? he asked. The group all vigorously shook their heads in the negative, and he rolled his eyes, chuckling. All right, all right, he drawled, waving a hand. I won't torture you any more. If you want to get your gear, I'll get you a care package set up for the ride. They all got up, stretching and separating to pack up their respective gear. There was no time to sit around and relax, with a long day ahead of them. Chapter 2 Whittaker sat behind the wheel of the SUV, Landry in the passenger seat and Rufus and Sparks hanging out in the back. The weather was on the cooler side, but the sun rising in the east warmed the redhead's face as she rolled down the window. She hung her arm out, dancing her fingers against the wind as the vehicle sped down the empty interstate. It had been weeks since Sparks had been out of their safe spot, being on constant guard all the time. Before all this began, she'd made the lonely drive from civilization to El Paso, driving through hours of nothingness. After the tedium of that trip, she'd sworn she'd never do it again. Such a strain on her sanity. This time, however, it brought a sense of peace, something she hadn't had in quite a while. Rufus watched her, cherry flyaways whirling around her pensive face, and his brow furrowed. You okay, girl? he asked gently. She didn't reply, simply continuing to stare, her hand floating up and down against the wind. He pursed his lips and reached over, giving her knee a light squeeze and she startled so hard she smashed her elbow against the window frame, hissing through her teeth. Whoa, sorry there, Rufus drawled, holding up his hand. You were just concerning me there. She gave him a smile as she playfully rubbed her elbow and gave him a little bump with her shoulder. It's okay, she replied. And yeah, I'm fine, just trying to take advantage of the calm before the storm. Girl, 
We're going to be in for a long day if I'm going to have to be the positive one. Rufus joked, smirking at her. You don't know there's a storm out there. This is a tiny blip on the map we're going to. Hell, I'd be surprised if it's even on a map. Whatever we find there, we'll be able to handle it. Sparks nodded and took his hand in hers, lacing their fingers together before resuming her pensive staring out the window. Yo, Rufus, Landry said, glancing over his shoulder. The older man raised an eyebrow. What's up? We got a long-ass drive ahead of us, the soldier said. You got any good Nam stories to tell us? Rufus barked a laugh. Shit, man. There wasn't nothing good about Nam, he replied, shaking his head. Just a never-ending stream of shitty weather, booby traps, and jumping every time a twig snapped in the woods. Landry paled, clenching his jaw with embarrassment, and turned to face forward, rubbing his forehead with his hand. Whittaker glanced in the rearview mirror. I think what numbnuts here meant to ask is if you have any good stories, she clarified. Because seeing as how you are a Texas boy with a penchant for explosives that isn't in jail, one can assume you've had some close calls with our boys in blue. Rufus chuckled, shaking his head. Thanks for translating, he said, and reached forward to pat Landry on the shoulder. Yeah, I've got some bangers. Hmm, what's going to be a good one? He sat back and thought for a moment before raising his hand with a smile. Okay. It was 1982, I do believe, and local dipshit Marty Harris was throwing a graduation party a few blocks over. Oh, this'll be good, Whittaker said with a laugh. Now, this was in a tiny-ass town, so the graduating class barely cracked double digits, Rufus continued. But old Marty was so excited about finally getting over the hump at age 21 that he invited everybody from the surrounding towns to come celebrate with him. Now, I'm a reasonable man, and I understand the need to celebrate one's accomplishments, even one as pathetic as graduating high school at age 21. I knew this party was coming, so I did the only thing I could do, which was walk down to the liquor store for a bottle of whiskey to keep me company for the night. Landry cocked a brow, turning around to look at him. Walk? Yeah, my truck was in the shop, but it wasn't a big deal because the store was only half a mile or so away, Rufus explained, waving his hand. What was a big deal was Marty getting there before me and buying out pretty much the entire store. I asked that little shit, as nicely as I possibly could, if I could have one of those bottles of whiskey. He tapped his chin. I forget exactly what he said in response to that, but it had something to do with questioning my lineage and advocating that I become an amateur proctologist. Both soldiers let out a low, ooh, sound, sharing dread at how badly this Marty had fucked up. Yeah, Rufus replied, nodding gravely. Well, he wanted me to be sober for his party, so I complied. Around five, I had some dinner, but instead of having my first drink of the night, I was sketching out my plan for the evening. Landry put a hand to his face. Oh, God, you didn't blow anything up, did you? He asked. Why don't you let me finish, and you'll find out, Rufus said with a wink. Whittaker reached over and playfully smacked the back of Landry's head, and the soldier grumbled to himself, settling in and quieting down. Now... I was all kinds of pissed off, Rufus continued, especially as the car started parking on my front lawn to walk over to the party. But I knew I couldn't risk an explosion. Most of these people didn't wrong me, just that asshole Marty. So I went with a backup plan. He grinned. A stink bomb. Landry snickered. Hard to argue with the classics, he said, shaking his head. But I fail to see how this qualifies as a good story. Just seems a bit mundane. Sorry. You've set off one of my redneck rattlers, Rufus said, pointing a finger at him. So you should know by now that I don't do anything mundane. The soldier cocked his head and nodded. This is true, he admitted. So, I used to carry stink bombs in my store, but they weren't big sellers, the older man continued. 
Thanks to that, I had a few hundred just sitting in storage. So I grabbed those and a stack of post-it notes and started writing, Enjoy your parting gift from Marty Harris on each one. By the time I had those all written, night had fallen, so it was time to strike. I went around to every single car parked on the street and snapped the top right off of a stink bomb, putting it right on the front windshield by the air conditioner intake. It was a muggy night, so I knew by the end of the party people would be firing those up on their drive home. It took me an hour or so, but I put a stink bomb and a parting gift note on every single car in a six-block radius. The soldiers cracked up, shaking their heads. I'm impressed with your insanely high levels of pettiness, Whitaker said, eyes glinting as she regarded him in the rearview mirror. Oh, wait, we ain't done yet. Rufus replied, grinning from ear to ear. I still had about fifty of those things left. So, I decided to go big. Made my way over to that little shit's house, and there was a hell of a party going on. The house was packed and was spilling out into the front yard. A couple hundred people at least. Even so, I managed to sneak around to the side of the house, where the air conditioner was, and that thing was running full tilt boogie. I popped the tops on the rest of those stink bombs and dumped the whole container on the vent. I barely got back across the street when I heard screaming and people rushing out of the house to vomit. The soldiers burst into laughter, Whitaker slapping the steering wheel in her mirth. So how did you get away with it? Landry asked, wiping tears from his eyes. Rufus smirked. I know this is going to come as a bit of a shock, he drawled, but I kind of had a reputation around town for being a bit salty. You? Whitaker gasped. Nah, can't see it. The older man chuckled. Hard to believe, I know, he replied. So once the shit hit the fan, the sheriff came by my place, banging on the door with a couple of his deputies, demanding to know why I sickened hundreds of people. Of course, I feigned innocence, which they weren't really buying. I asked them why they thought it was me, and they said they knew my store sold those stink bombs. I immediately flew into a panic, grabbing a flashlight and rushing out the back to the storage shed. Now, I may be a bit crazy in the head, especially in those days, but I wasn't no dummy. I led the sheriff out there to find that the lock on my shed had been broken open. More laughter erupted from the soldiers. Landry shook his head. Genius, he said through his giggles. That must have been one hell of a scene. You're damn right it was, Rufus confirmed. I was ranting and raving, demanding the sheriff find whoever was responsible and arrest them. Took them a good five minutes to calm me down. They then showed me one of the notes from the car, asking if I knew old Marty. I said yeah, and told them about how he was being aggressive towards me at the liquor store earlier. I could see it in the sheriff's eyes that he wasn't convinced of my innocence, but he knew he wouldn't have a case, so they left. Whitaker shook her head. So what happened to Marty? she asked. He skipped town a couple weeks later, because everybody kept targeting his house and car with pranks, Rufus explained, shaking his head and chuckling. Apparently, a rumor started spreading around that he'd done the stink bombs because he wanted to be remembered as a legend in town for pulling off the biggest practical joke ever. Landry raised an eyebrow. Now, how did a vicious rumor like that get started? He asked, with the tone of a condescending teacher. I don't know, the older man replied innocently. But I can tell you that my teenage employee, who spent years being bullied by Marty, might have told a person or two that version of events. Whitaker finally caught her breath and shook her head. Remind me to stay on your good side, Rufus, she declared. You just keep kicking ass and you'll be good in my book, he assured her. And Landry, if you want to start kicking ass one of these days, you'll earn some respect in my book too. The three of them chuckled, even Landry, and then they passed a sign reading, Sheffield, two miles. Time to get our game faces on. Rufus said with a sigh, and gave Sparks his hand a squeeze to get her attention. She looked at him and nodded begrudgingly, pulling her arm in the window and rolling it up. 
Don't worry, girl, Rufus said gently. You still have our ride back in a bit. She nodded and gave him a soft smile, hoping that he was right, that it was going to be a quick walk in the park before heading back home. After all, there was a first time for everything. Chapter 3 Whittaker pulled the SUV off of the highway, stopping at the bottom of the exit ramp. Across the street there was a rusted sign pointing to the south boasting Sheffield. They looked around, but there was absolutely nothing even close to civilization nearby. Are we sure there's actually a town here? Landry asked. Whittaker shrugged. I mean, they spent money to put a sign up, she said. Right, because politicians never waste taxpayer money, he quipped. Let's hang a right and see what we got, Sparks suggested. Just keep it slow. On it, Whittaker replied and made the turn. They moved up the two-lane road, winding for a bit, cutting through the desert before opening up to the town, if one could call it that. The main road looked straight through to the other side of town, no more than four or five blocks until it disappeared off into nothingness. They stopped the vehicle a quarter mile away from the gas station, which was up on the road on the right. Well, on the plus side, it shouldn't take us too long to clear the town, Rufus said. Landry scratched the back of his head. Do you all want to do a drive through and see what we're dealing with? he asked. We should fill up on gas first. Sparks said, shaking her head. If we do run into trouble, the last thing we want is to run out of gas while trying to escape. Whittaker nodded. Gas station it is, she said, and drove up, weaving around a few corpses in the parking lot before pulling up alongside one of the pumps. Once the SUV stopped moving, they all looked around to make sure nothing was moving out there, and it didn't seem to be. The quartet cautiously got out of the vehicle, clutching their guns tightly. Landry, see if you can find a generator to kick on so we can fill up, Whittaker said quietly. The air was so quiet and still, it almost felt eerie, like they should be whispering. Landry nodded and walked around the side of the building. Meanwhile, Sparks and Rufus walked over to the corpses in the parking lot. Pretty sure they're dead, Rufus said as she knelt down beside a man in gas station coveralls. That's not what concerns me she muttered as she rolled the body over. There was a bit of a stench and a few bullet holes in his chest. They looked him over, not finding any zombie bites. Look how fresh he is, she continued. Skin has just barely started to decay. No bites, no headshot. Rufus crossed his arms. You thinking this was recent? A day, maybe two, depending on the weather, she replied with a nod. I don't remember how warm it was yesterday. Yeah, everything just starts running together when you're locked up inside, Rufus agreed. Sparks patted the body down, eventually finding a wallet tucked away in his back pocket. She pulled it out and looked at the license. Address is here in Sheffield, she said. Maybe some pissed off locals, Rufus suggested. She took a deep, thoughtful breath. Or he got some unwanted visitors who didn't want to share the gas. The power kicked on, the pumps springing to life, and Whittaker immediately pulled the handle, having already inserted the pump into the tank. Sparks and Rufus approached the other body, flipping that one over too, finding a young man. He was dressed in bloody jeans and a t-shirt, with the same injury pattern of bullets across his chest. The couple shared a concerned look. You were saying about that storm? Rufus asked dryly. Sparks sighed heavily. I just love being right, she muttered. They stood up and headed back over to the SUV, joining Whittaker. They say anything to you? she asked, resting her foot on the back tire as she continued to fill the tank. Yeah, they said that we're in for a long day, Rufus declared. She furrowed her brow. They aren't zombies, but they're relatively fresh kills, Sparks explained. A day, maybe two? Whittaker's gaze darkened. So we might have hostiles? she asked. I think we should proceed as though we do, the redhead confirmed. The soldier nodded and topped off the tank before screwing the cap on and replacing the pump in its holder. Landry emerged from the gas station with an armload of snacks, 
a candy bar sticking out of his mouth as he juggled his haul. He stopped short when he looked up and realized all three of his companions were staring at him. What? he mumbled through a mouthful of chocolate. Whittaker jerked a thumb over her shoulder. Put the shit in the car, we got trouble, she said. Landry rolled his eyes and tossed his load into the front seat, grabbing his gun. Just once I want an easy day, he moaned, and then sighed. What do we got? Our friends over there were murdered, recently, Sparks explained. Hostiles are probably still in town. Landry didn't react, simply slinging his rifle over his shoulder and heading to the back of the SUV. He opened up the trunk and rummaged for a moment before pulling out the drone that Ricky had given them. Well, let's see what we can see, then, he said. The other three took up positions around the SUV, keeping watch on the area as he got the drone set up. After a few moments, he powered it on and launched the little device, quickly gaining altitude. Soon, they had a bird's-eye view of the town. Landry struggled with the controls a bit, trying to get a handle on it. Finally, he managed to start getting it moving parallel to the main road, looking down each cross street, narrating as he went. First road looks to be houses, he said. Have a little movement towards the far end, could be a zombie. Next road is more houses, again some movement near the far end. He paused. Holy shit, we got something here. The trio clustered around him to see what was on the monitor. At the far end of a row of businesses, they spotted a crowd of zombies around a standalone building. There were thirty, maybe forty of them, completely surrounding it. Looks like whatever killed our friends over there got themselves in a bit of trouble, Rufus murmured. Landry shook his head. I say we leave them to rot, he said. No sense wasting bullets on murderers. And how do you know they weren't just defending themselves? Whittaker asked. For all we know, those mechanics over there could have been the aggressors. Rufus took a deep breath. At least one of them lived here in town, he explained. I get your point, but it looks like they were just defending themselves. And besides, do we really want to risk it? Landry added. We're already burning through supplies at an alarming rate. Whittaker chewed her lip. Still, if they were just defending themselves... We came here to get stuff, and that's exactly what we're going to do, Sparks piped up forcefully. When we leave, we can use the vehicles to lure the zombies away from the building. If someone is in there, they'll have a chance to get out. We're not burdened with more mouths to feed, we limit our danger, and they can go about their merry way. Does that work for everybody? The trio glanced at each other and then back at her, nodding. Landry, Whitaker. I want you two to start going through every garbage and storage shed that you can find, she said, pointing to them. We need gas cans. Landry nodded. No problem, he said. Only go three-fourths of the way down the road, Sparks continued. Don't want to risk getting too close to the zombies. He nodded again. What are you two gonna do? he asked. Rufus grinned. Gonna round us up some vehicles, he drawled. Let's meet back here in thirty. Sparks added. The soldiers hopped into the SUV, and Whittaker leaned her head out the driver's side window. You want to lift to the first house? she asked. Nah, we're just going to walk it, the redhead replied, shaking her head. Keep our options open in case there are others in town. Whittaker nodded. That's a good point, she agreed. In that case, we'll start at the far end of the first road and work our way back to you. We'll see you in a few then, Rufus agreed, giving her a little salute. The two soldiers drove off towards their starting point while Sparks and Rufus began a leisurely stroll towards the first house, which was a couple hundred yards away. They walked in silence, with Rufus knowing that Sparks just wanted a few more moments of peace before having to deal with the zombies on the other side of town. Chapter 4 Landry and Whittaker flung open a garage door, quickly raising their weapons in case of a surprise guest. When it was clear they were alone, they lowered their guns and stepped inside. Really makes you wonder where all these people went, he said as he surveyed the empty garage. There was a loud thud from the door leading to the house, and Whittaker raised an eyebrow. Looks like they just wanted to die at home, she said dryly. She inspected the door, as the banging was incredibly loud 
but the door was secure and opened inward, so there was no danger of the creature getting through. Living in a town this removed from civilization, it seems to me they died inside a long time ago, Landry said as he rummaged through some bins on the shelves lining the far wall. Whittaker shook her head as she moved some trash cans in the corner. Nothing wrong with the desire to get away from people, she replied. Just ask any retail worker. Oh, yeah, I've heard the horror stories, he replied with a shudder. Here we go, he said as he finally found a five-gallon metal gas container. He picked it up and shook it, happy at the sound of sloshing going on inside. Looks like we've got a little extra here, too, he declared as he turned around to face her. Did you smell it? Whittaker asked. He unscrewed the cap and took a whiff, wrinkling his nose and shaking his head. Well, we got kerosene, he said. Still, we can dump it and use the container. Just toss it in the back as is for now, she suggested. Kerosene might come in handy if we can find one of those heaters. Landry nodded and left the garage to follow her instructions as she continued to poke around. He opened the back of the SUV, carefully placing the container in, nestled with the five others they'd already found. As he shut the door, he nearly jumped out of his skin at the sight of a body standing next to the vehicle. He instinctively raised his gun, but the woman threw her hands up, eyes widening. Please don't shoot! Please! she cried. Landry lowered his rifle, letting out a deep breath. Jesus Christ, girl, you about gave me a heart attack. He huffed, his shoulders relaxing. You okay? Whittaker asked, rushing out of the garage. As soon as she laid eyes on the young woman, she drew her handgun, aiming it towards her. The woman shrieked and raised her hands higher, taking a step back. Relax, it's just a girl, Landry said gently, motioning to the thin wisp of a young woman. She looked like she hadn't eaten properly in months. Whittaker pursed her lips. I can see that, she said tersely. But in case you didn't know, us girls can be a threat too. He scratched the back of his head, nodding and keeping his hand on his rifle, but letting her take the lead. What's your name? Whittaker asked. J Judy? The woman stammered. My name is Judy. The soldier nodded. Where did you come from? She demanded. My daughter and I are holed up in the house across the street. Judy explained, pointing a finger without lowering her hands. Been there a couple of days now. Whittaker cocked her head. Couple of days, huh? She asked. So you're not from here? No, we got here two days ago, Judy replied, shaking her head. So I'm guessing you have a pretty good idea of what happened up at the gas station, the soldier asked, eyes like steel. Tears rolled down the woman's face as she nodded and swallowed hard. We... we stopped for gas because we were running on empty, she said, voice thick. They decided that the only thing they wanted in payment for the gas was me. I begged them to stop, but they wouldn't. At that point, my husband and his friends pulled up. After that, it was a blur. She lowered her hands to her cheeks, shaking her head emphatically. There was some yelling, then gunshots, then blood. My daughter was hysterical, and I kind of was too. My husband came and dropped us off at this house and told us to stay put until they got back. But they never came. She choked on a sob. Whittaker and Landry glanced at each other. Both skeptical, but the former lowered her gun. I think I know where your husband and his friends are, she said. Judy's eyes grew wide. Oh my God, she breathed. Are they okay? We think so, Landry replied. They're trapped, but if the zombies outside are still trying to get in, then there's a good chance they're alive in there. Please, please, you have to get them out, Judy pleaded, pressing her hands together in a prayer. I don't know how much longer we can stay here, but I can't live without them. The soldiers shared a confused glance. Why can't you stay here? Landry asked, raising an eyebrow. Judy swallowed hard. Because they're coming, she whispered. Who's coming? Whittaker asked, shoulders tensing up. They're dead, Judy hissed. Landry rolled his eyes. Not sure if you've noticed, ma'am, but the dead are everywhere, he drawled rolling a hand over his head. They're not going to chase you out. You don't understand, she said hoarsely. There are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of those things walking down the interstate. It's only a matter of time before they swallow this town whole. The soldiers exchanged another glance. There was a chance she could be lying. 
But if she wasn't, was it worth the risk not taking precautions? Okay, Whitaker said, taking a deep breath. This is what I want you to do. I want you to go back to your daughter. You lock those doors up tight and wait for us. Judy's eyes widened again, and she waved her hands in front of her face. No, no, please, she begged. Please don't leave us here. It's okay, Whitaker replied gently. We're not going to abandon you, but we need to get our friends so we can help you, okay? And if we're on a timetable, you're only going to slow us down. She sniffled and wiped her nose, finally calming down enough to nod in agreement. Okay, I'll be in the house, she agreed. Please, please be careful, and hurry. She turned tail and ran back across the street, leaving the two soldiers to wait for the sound of a slamming door. Do you buy it? Landry murmured. Whitaker tongued her cheek. The gas station guy's wanting to rape her? She asked. Not for a second. What about the marching horde? He asked. I think we should check it out, she suggested, just to be safe. Landry nodded and headed around the SUV. They got in and sped off down the road, parking out front of the house that the others were inside. You already stocked up on gas cans? Rufus asked as he emerged from the front door. Whitaker shook her head, leaning out the window. No, but we might have some trouble, she explained. What's up? Sparks asked as she came out, and the duo approached her. We found a survivor, Whitaker explained. A young woman with an alleged daughter. Claims her husband and his friends are the ones trapped in the store. Rufus raised an eyebrow. Doesn't sound like much trouble to me. She also said an army of the dead, hundreds of thousands strong, is marching down the interstate. Whitaker continued. We're going to drive up a few miles to see what we can see. Better safe than sorry, you know? Sparks nodded sharply. Be quick, she said. If she is telling the truth, we may have to make a break for it. Whitaker nodded and punched the gas, speeding down the road. Sparks swallowed hard before shaking her head. Rufus, I think this storm just went from a thunderhead to a hurricane. Chapter 5 Whitaker floored the SUV, gaining speed rapidly as they reached the interstate. The windows were down and they focused intently on the road ahead, concerned that the young woman was telling the truth. The road in front of them stretched for a mile or so before curving around a rock formation. She had to be exaggerating, right? Landry finally broke the tense silence. Like, there's no way there are hundreds of thousands of those things together, right? Whitaker shook her head. I hate to admit it, but it's possible, she said. How in the hell would that be possible? Landry demanded. The interstate we're on is a straight shot to San Antonio and Houston, where millions lived, she replied. You get a big enough group headed west, and they probably pick up more as they go. Landry contemplated for a moment, as the vision of such a thing settled into his mind. Fuck me, man, he breathed. The SUV moved at a good clip, about fifty miles per hour. She navigated the curve quickly and then slammed into the front edge of a zombie horde. Within seconds, she plowed through a dozen ghouls, resulting in the SUV being partially surrounded. There was a brief lull as both the soldiers and the zombies processed what had just happened. Landry jerked his arm into the vehicle as ghouls began to reach for him and frantically rolled up the window. Back it up, back it up, back it up, he screamed. Whittaker threw the SUV into reverse and floored it. The tires spun coated in the blood of the zombies they'd run over. While she struggled to gain traction, Landry pulled his handgun out to try to fight off the arms that were wedged into the window he was trying to close. He smacked away hands and finally began firing through the opening, hitting ghouls in the head to buy them precious seconds. Get this thing moving! he cried. Finally the tires gained traction and lurched backwards. Whittaker kept the pedal to the floor, putting some distance between them and the massive horde. She slammed on the brakes about thirty yards away, pausing briefly. They looked out at the sea of corpses, stretching completely across both sides of the interstate and back as far as they could see, which wasn't too far given the rock formation. We need to go, Landry urged. Whitaker stayed transfixed on the creatures, watching as they slowly made their way towards them, a constantly moving mass of rotted flesh moving as one. Landry grabbed her arm and shook her violently. Whitaker! he yelled. Drive the fucking car! 
she finally snapped out of it, executing a quick three-point turn and speeding off towards the town exit less than a mile away. Jesus fucking Christ! What the fuck are we going to do? Landry babbled, scrubbing his hands down his face. First thing we're doing is getting Sparks and Rufus loading up and getting the fuck out, Whitaker said firmly. He threw his hands up. Well, obviously, he said, sarcasm evident in his tone. I meant more long term. Like, how in the fuck are we going to stop that many of those things? I don't know, she growled, shaking her head. All I know is we gotta focus on the task at hand, which is getting our people and getting out. We'll figure the rest out later. Landry leaned forward, eyes widening. Oh, fuck, he cried. Whittaker looked around frantically, heart pounding, trying to figure out what had caused his sudden outburst. What? she demanded. Judy's husband, Landry said, turning to her. Are we just going to leave them there to die? Whittaker slammed on the brakes just before the exit, focusing intently on the rearview mirror. What are you doing? he snapped. Trying to see how much time we have, she explained, raising her wrist and exposing her watch. Not much, and certainly not enough to be wasting he said, voice shrill. Only need a minute, and it'll go faster if you're not yapping, she said firmly. Those things were back about thirty yards from the turn, she glanced at her watch, then back at the mirror. A few seconds later, the front edge of the horde appeared around the rock formation. Fuck my life. Landry clenched his jaw, staring at her with wide eyes. What is it? he asked. Those things are moving fast, she replied, and popped the car into gear. How much time do we have? he asked. Whittaker took a deep breath as she punched the gas. Maybe half an hour before they get to the exit? Chapter 6 Whittaker sped down the small road, skidding as she made the turn onto the first side street. The noise was so loud that both Sparks and Rufus came running out of a house with their guns in hand, thinking they were under attack. Whittaker slammed on the brakes in front of them, both soldiers leaping from the SUV. Rufus surveyed the blood and damage to the front of the vehicle. So, how big of a shitstorm are we in for? he drawled. Category five, and then some, Landry replied. Rufus shook his head and sighed. Shit. So she wasn't exaggerating? Sparks asked, rubbing her forehead. We couldn't get a full look because of the rock formations, Landry admitted. But no, it doesn't look like she was exaggerating. The redhead put her hands on her hips. So how much time do we have? She asked. Maybe half an hour before they reach the exit? Whittaker replied. Rufus jerked a thumb over his shoulder. I got one truck up and running and we found a couple of gas cans. He said. I say we load up what we got and hit the road. What about our friends trapped in the store? Whittaker asked, cocking her head. Just doesn't feel right to leave them there with what's coming. Everyone looked around at each other, blank stares betraying that nobody really knew what the right answer was. Finally, Sparks put up her hands. We do it quick, she said. Rufus, get the truck, she pointed to the soldiers. Landry, I want you in the back for crowd control. If you see any turning back, you pop them in the head. Whitaker and I will flank them and get into the store once it's clear. We tell them what's up, and then we haul ass. She looked around. Any objections? When the other three shook their heads in the negative, she waved a hand. Then let's move, because we don't have a lot of time. Rufus and Landry hopped into the truck, firing it up and heading off towards the storefront. Whitaker and Sparks jogged towards their destination, wanting to remain as quiet as possible so they weren't detected. The run took them a few minutes, and the two women kept their heads on a swivel, constantly looking around for zombies. As they approached the end of the road to turn south, there was a trio of ghouls that shambled towards them. We don't have time, Sparks huffed. Just ignore them. Whitaker nodded and they turned south, darting through front yards. They hopped a fence before taking cover behind a house about a block away from the store. Even though they were a good fifty yards from the rear entrance, they could see several ghouls back there, banging on the back door. How are we doing on time? Sparks whispered. Whitaker checked her watch. Twenty-three minutes until we're in trouble, she reported. Let's hope they hurry then, the redhead murmured. Rufus popped the trunk into reverse and sped down the road towards the zombies, parking about twenty yards from them. You ready? he called through the back window. 
Landry gave him a thumbs up. Let's do it. Rufus laid on the horn, holding it down, and the sharp bleat quickly gained the attention of most of the zombies. The corpses turned away from the store and shambled towards the truck. Landry took a knee, aiming his rifle. When they were within ten yards, he held up a hand. All right, bud, he called. Start moving. Rufus inched the truck forward, keeping pace with the zombies, who stayed within a ten-yard buffer. Landry looked over them towards the store and spotted a dozen or so ghouls still banging on the front windows, not paying the truck any attention. He took aim, making sure to be careful about risking shooting the glass, and fired. The first bullet ripped through the head of a creature near the back, and it crumpled to the ground. The sound of the head exploding in a fantastic spray of blood and bone, coupled with the body hitting the asphalt, drew the attention of six other zombies, pulling them away from the door. Stubborn bastards, Landry muttered. Come on, come to daddy. He aimed again, this time at the ground by their feet, since they were too close to the glass doors to risk a headshot. He fired, and the bullet smacked into the ground by their legs, sending shrapnel up into their calves. Of course, the ghouls didn't notice, and continued banging on the door. Sorry, ladies, best I can do for you, he muttered. You get em, Rufus called back from the cab. Landry shook his head. All but six, he replied. They just don't want to break away from the door. That's good enough, Rufus declared. Six of them don't stand a chance against our girls. Landry sat down in the truck bed, still keeping an eye on the zombies near the back of the pack in case they broke off to head towards their teammates. Whittaker and Sparks remained behind cover, looking through the gaps in the buildings to see the ghouls moving away. The ones in front of the store headed off, but four remained in the back, unmoved by the noise. "'Think they got all of them?' Sparks whispered. Whittaker snickered. "'It's Landry,' she replied, rolling her eyes. If he managed to attract half of them, I'll be pleasantly surprised. The redhead cracked a smile and pulled out a knife, prompting her partner to arm herself with a blade as well. Let's take out the ones at the back and see if we can get inside, Sparks murmured, and Whittaker nodded in agreement. The duo darted out from behind cover, running across the grass and racing up to the four zombies still focused on the door. Sparks reached the group first, jamming her blade into the back of a head on the far left of the line. As the body dropped, Whittaker reached the right side and took out a ghoul in the same fashion. Both women reacted quickly, the next two zombies turning around to meet blades in their faces. With all four corpses on the ground, the duo looked around to make sure the commotion didn't attract any other enemies. Once they were sure they were in the clear, Sparks knocked on the door with a shave and a haircut, two bits, to let the survivors inside know that she was a human. They waited several moments, but there was no response. I say we give it another shot and then go around front, Whittaker said quietly. Sparks nodded and then gave another knock. This time, a muffled voice asked, Hello? Is someone there? Yes, we're here to help, Sparks replied. Okay, just... The person replied, Give me a moment. There was some clanking behind the door, like it was being unlatched. A moment later, it opened a crack, revealing a sliver of a middle-aged man dressed in bloody jeans and a splattered dress shirt. He looked disheveled, with a wild look in his eyes, as if he hadn't slept in days. Like I said, Sparks said gently, we're here to help. The man nodded, but still didn't open the door all the way. You want to let us in? Whittaker asked, impatience clear in her tone, because we're on a tight timetable. He furrowed his brow in confusion but then pushed the door open wide. I'm sorry, I just... He trailed off, shaking his head. It's been a long few days. Preaching to the choir, brother, Whittaker said, patting his shoulder on the way by. Preaching to the choir. He let them inside before shutting the door and securing it tight. It appeared they were in a storage room for what looked like a general goods store. How many of you were in here? Sparks asked. The man crossed his arms as if hugging himself for warmth, Six of us, he said. We got trapped in here trying to secure goods before moving on. Sparks led them through the storage room, with Whittaker on her heels, and their new acquaintance about five yards behind. Not a bad idea, given what's just up the road, Whittaker said. The man stopped short in his tracks. Oh, God, he moaned. They're still coming? The soldier nodded, turning back towards them. Afraid so, man, 
she said. Afraid so. Sparks pulled back a curtain that led to the main area of the store. It was a fairly large single room with numerous racks spread out. In the center of the store was a makeshift camping area where they'd appeared to have spent the night. As the redhead crossed the threshold, the man cupped his hand around his mouth and yelled, Good news, guys! We're saved! As his voice echoed, two men stood up from the center of the room. One of them was dressed in hunter's gear, and the other donned a police officer's uniform. Sparks' memory flashed, and she immediately recognized the cop as Officer Carter from Junction, the man who had set them up to die on Sonora. Unfortunately, he seemed to recognize her at the same time and drew his gun. Son of a bitch! he bellowed. It's her! Oh, shit! Sparks hissed, and whipped around to shove Whittaker to the floor before diving in the opposite direction. Carter and four other men began firing, bullets ripping through the back wall. The man who had let them in took a shot in the shoulder and fell back to the ground, cursing in pain. Fan out and get em, Carter barked. Sparks looked through the display cases, watching feet moving in multiple directions rapidly. She rose into a crouch, tracking the rightmost set of shoes running towards her. She timed it so that when he reached a break between the displays, she fired. The bullet was on the mark, hitting him in the side and sending him grunting to the ground. She dove for cover as three nearby men opened fire in her direction and crawled on the ground towards the back counter register for more cover. Whittaker, meanwhile, was on the ground watching one of the hunters move in her direction. She quickly leapt up, smacking his rifle away and causing him to fire an errant shot into the wall. The soldier delivered a few strikes to the man's face, making him drop his gun, and then spun him around, using him as a human shield, raising a handgun to his temple. Everybody calm the fuck down, she bellowed. Carter and the other two men turned to the fuming woman, lowering their weapons but still holding on to them. Okay, the officer said slowly. Let's everybody take a beat here. Fuck that, Whitaker spat. Put your guns down or your boy here loses his head. She dug the barrel of her gun so hard into the man's temple that he let out a whimper of pain. Carter, she ain't bluffing, he moaned shakily. Well, at least one of you isn't as stupid as you look, Whitaker snapped and looked at Carter. Drop it now! He tossed his gun on the floor, motioning for his buddies to do the same. Kick them away and keep your hands high, she instructed, and the men did his orders. Good. Now somebody want to fill me in? Before anybody could say anything, the loud screeching of tires echoed outside. Carter and his men dove out of the way as a truck smashed through the front of the store, shattering everything and sending zombies flying through the air. When it came to a stop, Landry popped up and aimed his assault rifle towards the men, who raised their hands. Rufus leapt out of the driver's seat, gun raised and eyes wild. "'Sparks, where are you, girl?' he cried. I'm over here, she said, standing up from behind the counter. I'm good. Rufus relaxed and nodded gratefully towards her before turning his attention towards the men. When he recognized Carter, his gaze darkened, and he marched forward, aiming right for the officer's forehead. You motherfucker, he snarled. I thought we told you to stay in your own fucking backyard. We didn't have a choice, man, Carter pleaded, hands high in the air. Those things! Those things just marched right through us! Junction too. Rufus jutted out his chin. I ought to kill you where you stand, he said, voice low and menacing. Would someone please fill me the fuck in? Whittaker barked. Landry peeked out the window, spotting the zombies they'd led away working their way back towards the commotion. Better make it the nickel version, he warned, because we have incoming. We ran into these assholes in Junction when we were fleeing to the west. Rufus explained. They said they'd take us and a whole busload of other survivors to a safe place. Whitaker raised an eyebrow, guessing it wasn't safe. Oh, it was plenty safe for them, Rufus said, sneering at the quivering officer. Especially after they opened fire and cut down every man, woman, and child on that bus. They tried to get us too, but that didn't work out too good for you, did it, Skippy? Carter swallowed hard. Please, do whatever you want with me, he begged. Just let my men go. Oh, how kind of you to give me permission to do whatever I want with you, Rufus drawled. Here I was thinking this gun against your forehead already gave me that. We got two minutes, Max, Landry cried, 
So if you're going to shoot him, then shoot him, because we gotta move. Rufus clenched his jaw, thinking really hard about whether or not to pull the trigger. He looked over at Sparks, who was smiling softly at him, and his heart burst. What do you think, girl? he asked. She walked up next to him, regarding the three men with a cold stare. Whose wife and child are in the house? she asked. The hunter on the right raised his chin. They're mine, ma'am, he said. She cocked her head, looking him over. He was young-looking, though more disheveled and out of it than even the man that had let them in the back door. The redhead glanced over at the man Whittaker still held hostage, noting that he wasn't that able-looking either. After scanning them all, she came to the conclusion that Carter was the only viable fighter amongst the whole pack. These guys will be dead within a week without this asshole, she said, shaking her head. If you kill him, we might as well go ahead and finish them all off. Rufus nodded, agreeing innately with her. He tossed his handgun up in the air, catching the barrel and then thrust it forward, smacking Carter directly in the nose with it. The crack was sickening, reverberating in the space as blood sprayed all over the men. Carter grunted and fell to the ground, holding his now crimson face. Pretty sure he can still fight with a broken nose, Rufus said, grinning at Sparks. She chuckled and turned to head to the truck. So, one of the hunters piped up, causing her to pause. Do we just follow you, or... If you want to die, sure, Sparks said, her voice suddenly cold. My threat from Sonora still stands. You follow us, you die. The only reason you're walking out of here today is because of that horde that's marching our way. If you have any sense at all, you'll get back into your vehicles and head north without looking back. The hunter trembled. But... but what's up there? He stammered. Not an army of the dead and not us, Sparks replied firmly which is all you need to concern yourself with. Now go! The man took a step towards his weapon, but Rufus put up a hand. Exit's in the rear, he said. The hunter's eyes widened. But we need our weapons, he protested. We'll leave them at the gas station for you, Rufus replied. Now go on, git! The men collected their wounded and headed out the back of the store, where their friend they'd shot was still groaning. You okay, girl? Rufus asked as they headed for the truck. Yeah, I'm fine, Sparks replied hoarsely. Gotta say, though, that was one heck of a dramatic entrance there. He scratched the back of his head. We heard the gunshots and thought you were in trouble, he explained. Didn't want to waste time with the whole getting out and opening a door. She smiled and gave his arm an affectionate squeeze. They all piled into the truck, Landry still in the bed to keep an eye on the zombies marching their way, still about thirty yards from the store. All right, Sparks declared. Let's get our gas and get the hell out of here. Chapter 7 The group parked in the middle of the interstate, a good mile away from the exit, truck and SUV side by side. They sat there watching in stunned silence as the zombie horde marched towards the exit. The ghouls were shoulder to shoulder, stretching across every available inch of asphalt, from one edge of the emergency parking lane to the other. The tail stretched back to the rock formation, vanishing around the curve. They just keep coming, Landry breathed in awe. Whittaker crossed her arms. I wonder how long that undead conga line is, she muttered. He sat up with a sense of urgency, his eyes alight with what was almost excitement. Let's find out. He jumped out of the SUV, running around to the back and throwing open the hatch. Rufus and Sparks glanced out at him from the truck, brows furrowed. "'What are you up to?' Rufus asked, hanging his head out the window. Landry rummaged around in the trunk for a moment before returning with the drone, holding it up proudly. "'We're going to see just how many of these things we're dealing with,' he declared, and set the drone on the hood of the SUV, fiddling with the dials to get it running. The others got out of their seats, joining him on the road to watch the screen as the drone took off. He navigated it towards the horde and rose as high as it would go into the air. I don't know how much range this thing has, he murmured as he worked the controls, so I'm going to go more for altitude than getting close to them. Everyone crowded around and watched the screen as the image trailed higher and higher. The horde stretched through the rock formation and extended far back to the horizon, which was kind of hard to tell how far that was given the low quality of the camera. Jesus, Rufus breathed. You can't even see the tail end of them. We should get back, 
Whitaker said sharply. We're going to have to pack up and evacuate. Landry shook his head. And go where? Back to Fabens, Whitaker replied. They need to know what's coming their way. Oh, good, he drawled, rolling his eyes. I'm sure the cartel is going to be thrilled we're stopping by for a sleepover. Sparks took a deep breath. Landry's right. It's going to be too dangerous for you two to go, she agreed. At least right now until we can figure out how to smuggle you in. You get spotted and that whole town is burning. The soldiers nodded. Landry began to pilot the drone back towards them, but the redhead put a hand on his arm. How much battery power do you have left? she asked. He squinted as he checked the screen. Probably ten, maybe fifteen minutes of flight time, he replied. Keep it in the air and focus the camera on the exit, Sparks instructed. He furrowed his brow. Why? he asked. Just humor me, she replied. He did as she asked, focusing the camera on the exit as the horde approached it. After several minutes, the front edge reached it, with some of the creatures peeling off from the interstate and onto the exit. Oh, God, what are they doing? Landry moaned. Rufus shook his head. They're complicating our lives, that's what they're doing, he muttered. They watched in horror as hundreds, approaching a thousand zombies, quickly exited the interstate and started flooding the streets. Go ahead and bring it down, Sparks said, and the soldier brought the device down for a landing as the group stood in a shell-shocked daze. So much for just hanging tight and hoping they go by us, Rufus muttered. Whitaker swallowed hard. A few stragglers we could handle, she said. But that looks like hundreds, maybe even thousands. Come on, we gotta get back to the others, Sparks said. Landry collected the drones and loaded up as they all got back into their respective vehicles. Whittaker and Rufus pushed down a little harder on those gas pedals, knowing that every second counted in this race against time. Chapter 8 The mini-caravan pulled up to their little slice of heaven, slamming on the brakes and piling out with a sense of urgency. Hammond and Jeff were outside, taking turns throwing rocks at some bottles they'd set up several yards away. Both men startled at the sudden racket, turning to face their approaching friends. Looks like they're excited to see us, the sergeant declared. Jeff shrugged. First time for everything. How'd it go? Hammond asked as they walked up to the group, seeing the urgency in their eyes. We're fucked six ways from Sunday, Sarge, Landry blurted. Hammond shook his head. Well, don't sugarcoat it, he said. Pretty sure he did, Sarge, Whitaker added, and that caught the sergeant's attention considering her normal calm and cool nature. We have to leave this place, and soon, Sparks piped up. Jeff's brow furrowed. What's going on? he asked. There are a few hundred thousand zombies headed our way, she explained, straight down the interstate. The two men blinked, stunned for a moment before Hammond finally stammered. We're going to need diesel for the truck if we're going to take it with us. Sparks shook her head. He'll be fine here, just make sure it's locked up tight she said. Just pull what we need for a week or so and we'll come get it later. Well, where are we going? Jeff demanded. Rufus and I are grabbing some supplies and heading to Fabens, the redhead replied, jerking a thumb over her shoulder. They need to know what's coming their way. We're coming with you, Hammond said firmly. She shook her head. It's too dangerous. Don't care, he declared, squaring his shoulders. We're coming with you. If that horde is as big as you say, then the cartel is going to have their hands full protecting the city. That's going to give us the perfect opportunity to get in and get Mathis. Sparks held up her hands, palms out. Sergeant, I agree that this is a golden opportunity to get into El Paso and get your man, but all that goes out the window if the cartel sees you coming into Fabens, she explained. Rufus and I can believably get in without them caring. I promise that getting Mathis out is a priority but right now I need you to keep your head about you and stay out of sight. Hammond took a deep breath and then finally nodded. So, where do you want us? he asked, letting out his breath with a whoosh. Because it doesn't sound like we're going to be able to stay here much longer. Get the gear and everyone packed up and head towards Marfa, Sparks instructed. Stay about five miles east of the town limits. Clara said there are some potential friendlies there, but she needs to do the introductions. When we get to Fabens, we'll send her back in your direction. Jeff raised his hand. And what about the rest of us? he asked. 
Ricky isn't exactly in fighting condition, and I don't think we're going to convince Mary to pick up a gun anytime soon. Stay with Hammond, Sparks replied. Those two are going to be a lot safer with the Marfa folks than they will be in Fabens. Once we get them secure, you can come back with Clara. Because I get the sense we're going to need you if we're going to survive this. Jeff nodded firmly. You got it, he said. How much time do we have before the Horde reaches us? Hammond asked. Whittaker tilted her head back and forth. Those things are going about two miles an hour, she replied. So probably a day and a half before they get here? Okay, good, the sergeant replied. I'm going to get everybody fed and let some sedatives take effect on Ricky before moving him. I know he's feeling better, but I don't want to push him any harder than we need to. Sparks nodded. I'm good with that, she said. We gotta get a move on, girl, Rufus urged. Get the sense we're going to need every minute. She nodded and turned towards the truck. Hold up a second, Hammond said, and headed for the garage door just across from the main residence. He reached inside and grabbed a small canvas bag, tossing it over to Sparks. Emergency go bag, he explained as she caught it. Two days of rations and some other goodies that might come in handy. She nodded and smiled. Thanks, she said, and hopped into the passenger seat. Rufus fired up the vehicle and spun it around before punching the gas. They paused briefly at the interstate entrance that looked to the east. Might as well soak in that sight now, he murmured, because it ain't gonna last much longer. Sparks took a deep breath. I knew this place wasn't a permanent stop for us, she admitted. Just would have been nice for it to last a little longer. He reached over and patted her on the leg with a reassuring smile. It'll be okay, girl, he drawled. When this is all over, we'll find us a nice quiet place to settle down. When she laughed, he raised an eyebrow. What's so funny? he asked. You just never struck me as the type to want to settle down, she replied, eyes shining as she gazed at him. He shrugged and winked at her. What can I say? he asked. The apocalypse has a way of changing a man. They shared a grin, and then he hit the gas, speeding down the interstate towards Fabens. Chapter 9 Leon and Rogers walked up to a house across the street from the high school. There was a hive of activity around both the school and surrounding houses, with people working on several projects inside and out. In front of the school, some people dug trenches, while others installed metal siding on the windows on the first floor of the building. Several people carried tools and other materials inside. The houses had fewer people, but still plenty of work being done. Some of the windows needed reinforcing with metal siding, while some rudimentary traps were being set up inside. So, remind me again of what the trenches are for? Rogers asked, scratching the back of his head. I don't think a couple of ditches are going to pose much of a threat to the cartel if they attack. Leon shrugged. Trenches can be effective in battle, he replied. Sure. If we were in France in 1915, the detective shot back, rolling his eyes. That doesn't seem to be the case here. Okay, you got me, Leon replied with a sigh. A couple of these people really wanted to help with the town defenses, and let's just say I wouldn't trust them with a pair of safety scissors. Figured they couldn't do much damage just digging trenches, he shrugged. Plus, if we do have some zombies pay us a visit, it will trip them up. They approached a house directly across the street from the school. The front windows were totally covered in metal sheeting, providing some defense. They walked inside and headed over to the kitchen counter, which had a hole cut in the top of it. Rogers raised an eyebrow. What do we have here? he asked. Take a look, Leon invited with a grin, motioning to the hole. Rogers leaned in and spotted a two-liter plastic soda bottle with something inside that looked suspicious. Viciously, not like soda. What am I looking at? He asked. That is a custom-made, remote-detonated chlorine bomb, Leon replied proudly. Roger's eyes widened. How many of these do we have? He asked. Three, Leon replied. Got this house, one on the north side and one on the south side of the school. The detective nodded. Well, it's something at least, he said. Do we have any non-trap-filled houses for us? Yeah, but nothing on the front line, though, Leon explained. 
One of the rooms at the middle school across the field survived the fire, so we reinforced it and turned it into a safe house. My thinking was the cartel would see that it's burned out and not worry about it. Outside of that, I have a safe house set up five blocks away. We made sure to camouflage it, though, putting the protection on the inside and dressing it up so that it looks like a normal window. Rogers raised an eyebrow. Why so far away? he asked. I just figured if something bad goes down, it might be wise to have people outside the battlefield, Leon explained. The detective nodded. Can't argue with that. As they stood by the kitchen counter, Clara yelled from outside. Leon! Rogers! she called. Where are you two? The detective shook his head. What did you do now? he teased. Whatever it was, I'm sure I can pin it on you, his friend replied, and they headed out of the house. You looking for us? Rogers asked, and she whipped around in the middle of the street. You gotta come with me now, she huffed as she ran over. The detective blinked at her. Is everything okay? No, it's not. Clara replied, shaking her head. I'll be in the school ready to strike if it comes to that, Rogers replied. She waved her hand in front of her face. No, no, it's not the cartel, she gushed. It's worse. The men exchanged a concerned look, and Leon finally threw up his hands. Well, what's going on? he demanded. She waved for them to follow her and started walking. It's going to be easier to let Sparks explain everything, she said. Her and her friend Rufus are in the command center. The men followed her, the three of them moving at almost a jog to the command center. They opened the door and found Rufus and Sparks sitting at a desk chatting with Ethel, who had poured them each a fresh cup of hot coffee. Good to see old Ethel here is taking good care of you, Rogers said as they approached. Rufus held up his steaming mug. Not sure how she knew we were coming, he drawled, but the coffee was fresh as soon as we pulled up. Well, she is the hostess with the mostest, Leon declared. Rogers blinked at him. The hostess with the mostest? He blurted. Did you really just say that? Well, it's true, isn't it? Leon replied sheepishly. The detective shook his head. Yeah, well, yeah, he stammered. It just sounded a bit weird coming out of your mouth. Would it make you feel better if I called her a fucking badass hostess? Leon asked. Language! Ethel sang playfully, wagging her finger. Leon motioned to her. See? He asked Rogers. You got me in trouble. You're not in trouble, sweetie, Ethel replied. Just if you're going to use that kind of language, do it right. I prefer motherfucking badass, not just fucking badass. The group roared with laughter at the little old lady using such colorful language, and she smiled triumphantly before gathering up some mugs for the newcomers. Gents, I would like you to meet Sparks and Rufus, Clara said as the trio reached the sitting couple. It's a pleasure to meet you two, Leon said, extending his hand. Rogers nodded as they all took turns shaking hands, and really good to finally have faces to go along with names. Good to meet you as well, Sparks replied. Just wish it was under better circumstances. Clara said there was a major problem, Leon prompted. If that ain't the mother of all understatements. Rufus muttered, shaking his head. This morning we ran a mission to the east of Fort Stockton, about seventy miles away, Sparks began, leaning back in her chair. While there we discovered that hundreds of thousands of zombies were marching straight down the interstate. Leon and Roger stood there, stunned, blinking at her. Hundreds of thousands? Leon breathed. The detective put a hand to his forehead. Are you sure? You mean, did we stop and do a head count? Rufus drawled. No, can't say that we did, but those critters covered every square inch of the interstate and stretched back at least a mile. How long until the satellite is in range? Rogers asked immediately. Leon checked his watch. Two minutes, he replied. Get it punched up, the detective instructed, and his partner rushed over to his desk, powering up the computer, as Sparks set down her mug and leaned forward. That's not our only problem, she said. Rogers rolled his eyes. Of course it's not, he said, sarcasm evident in his tone. Why would it be? They're not just staying on the interstate, she explained. When they come to an exit, hundreds or maybe even thousands are shoving off the main road. We don't know how far down they go once they take the exit, Rufus added. But even so, it's not good. Leon spun around in his chair. 
Well, as soon as this baby comes online, we'll see just how deep they penetrate, he said. That's what she said, Rufus quipped. Sparks shot him an incredulous look. Really? He shrugged. Just trying to fit in, he said. Leon chuckled. You got a keeper there, Sparks. So what is this thing, anyway? Rufus asked before taking a loud slurp of his coffee. Well, before I made my unscheduled departure from the military, Leon began, I <clears throat> borrowed this piece of machinery from them. It connects to a satellite so we can get a real-time view of the situation on the ground. Rufus nodded thoughtfully. Wish I would have thought of that, he drawled. All I got was some shrapnel and a healthy dose of PTSD. If it's any consolation, nothing has really changed since your day, Leon replied. That's still the standard parting gift. Rufus barked a laugh. Good to know there's still at least one normal thing left in this world. The monitor flickered to life, a real-time image coming up. It was high altitude, but Leon quickly zoomed in on their location. So how far down was it again? he asked as he typed. Sparks got up and headed over to the desk to watch. About seventy miles east of Fort Stockton, she replied, straight up the interstate. There is some small town just south of the main road. Shouldn't be too hard to find, Leon murmured as he worked. He moved the camera down the interstate, quickly crossing over Fort Stockton and moving towards the horde. It didn't take long before the grey asphalt turned into a solid, dark line. Whoa. That doesn't look good, he said, and zoomed in on the front edge of the horde. The zombies moved slowly down the freeway. The image looked like it was hovering about thirty feet above the ground, so while they couldn't exactly make out individual features, the mass was clearly moving. If only we had some idea of how fast they were moving, Rogers murmured, stepping up behind his friend. We thought of that, Sparks piped up. Rough estimate is two miles an hour. Rogers turned away from the screen. Ethel, I need a map, please, he said, and then glanced at Sparks. What's the name of the town? It's called Sheffield, she replied. He walked away as Leon zoomed out from the close perspective to get a better view of how far they went back. Rufus approached to watch, and the trio gasped at the sight of the line stretching for what appeared to be miles. Where is that town at again? Leon asked. Just look south of the interstate and keep moving east, Sparks instructed. It's going to be the only buildings you see. He moved the camera along, parallel to the interstate, headed to the east. After a moment, they found the town, again prompting an audible gasp. Jesus, Rufus breathed. These things act like a wind-up toy. Just point them in a direction and they keep walking. They huddled around the screen, watching the entire town swallowed by zombies. Easily two or three thousand ghouls roamed around over every exposed space. Check the interstate. Spark said softly. Leon moved the camera up and they saw the line of zombies had passed by. He zoomed the camera up until they could see the tail end of it, which appeared to be a few miles to the west. How long has it been since you left this town? Leon asked. Rufus shrugged. I don't know, maybe five hours? He replied. Leon zoomed the camera out so he could see the entirety of the line and how far back it was from the town. He focused intently on it, doing calculations in his head. After a moment of muttering to himself, he cleared his throat and spoke at his regular volume. That line is two to three miles long, he said, and doing some rough calculations on the side of the road and average width of a human being, there are somewhere between half a million and a million zombies headed our way. There was a moment of silence before Rufus sputtered. Oh, is that all? he asked. Well, I got thirty rounds for my handgun, so that gets us halfway there. Nobody laughed, and Sparks patted his arm in thanks for trying to lighten the mood. Now we just have to figure out how long we have to deal with this, Leon said, letting out a deep breath. Rogers stood up from the map he'd been studying. I need a calculator, he called. Got one in my head, let's go, Leon said, whirling his chair around. Best I can tell using this map, the detective began. Sheffield is 280 miles from Fabens. Leon nodded. So if they're moving at two miles an hour, paused, that gives us uh, 140 hours before they arrive on our doorstep, or just under six days. There was another long moment of silence as everyone stood stock still, 
unsure of what to do or say. Finally, Sparks took a deep breath. Rogers, see how far they are from Fort Stockton, she instructed, and whatever other potential choke points you can find. And the Fort Davis exit, Clara added. We're going to have to go and warn them. Rogers leaned over his map to get to work. So, Rufus said, flopping down into his chair and slapping his knees, I don't suppose that satellite of yours has tactical nukes or anything, does it? Leon chuckled. Man, the military barely lets me have intelligence, he replied, shaking his head. You think they'd give me access to something like a nuke? Based on the quality of our politicians, I'd say that having intelligence is a disqualifying trait to having access to nukes, Rufus quipped. Leon threw his head back and laughed. Sparks, you really got a keeper here, he gasped. She blinked at him in confusion, having been lost in thought, and snapped out of it at the sound of her name. You okay, girl? Rufus asked, furrowing his brow. Just thinking, she replied, and then turned to Clara. I need you to do me a favor before you go to Marfa to speak to those guys, she said. Clara nodded. Anything. Hammond and his crew were holed up five miles to the east of town with Jeff, Ricky, and Mary, Sparks explained. Ricky is in no condition to fight, and I need you to convince them to allow them in. Clara furrowed her brow. Why don't Hammond and company just hightail it out of harm's way until they pass? She asked. Probably because they want to use this as an opportunity to get Mathis, Leon piped up from his desk. Yep, Sparks replied. Took a lot of convincing on my part to get them to hang tight instead of rushing up here. Leon shook his head. Well, that's good because the cartel has been keeping a close eye on us ever since the assassination attempt, he said. They have a car on the other side of the bridge just watching us. We probably confused the hell out of them when we came rolling in, Rufus said with a chuckle. You did them a favor, Leon joked. Probably the most entertainment they're going to get today. Rogers approached with a notepad, waving it around to get everyone's attention. You should know I care about each and every one of you, he began, because I did math. After some light chuckles, he tapped his pencil on the paper. We have roughly 32 hours until they reach Fort Stockton, he explained. 95 until they reach Van Horn, and 175 before they hit El Paso. Leon nodded. Okay, time to get Rodriguez up here to tell him what's up, he suggested. Because whether we like it or not, we're going to need the cartel's help. Cartel's help? Rufus blurted. Why not just evacuate? You can't have that many people here, can you? We have eighty-something, Rogers replied. From the other side of the room, Ethel piped up. Eighty-seven. Thanks, Ethel, the detective called back. Leon shook his head. We're not doing anything until we talk to Rodriguez, he said firmly. The cartel is watching us, so God only knows what their orders are. Clara, I want you to go ahead and take off for Marfa. Rufus took his keys from his pocket and tossed them over to her. Go ahead and take my truck, he said. Maybe we'll get lucky and they'll think we were just dropping off supplies. And if it's okay, Sparks continued, Jeff is going to ride back with you. Clara nodded and turned to leave. Hold up, Leon said, holding up a hand. I'm going to have you drop me off at the bridge. I gotta talk to the cartel boys, which, if nothing else, should distract them while you haul ass. She nodded again. I'm ready when you are. Y'all hang tight, Leon said, motioning to the group. I'll be right back. Clara and Leon exited the building and hopped into the truck. She fired it up and threw it into gear, heading for the bridge. She stopped a block away from the on-ramp to the interstate, peering over at a luxury sedan sitting on the side of the road, facing them. We got some fancy lads today, it would seem, Leon quipped. Guess when you don't have to go through a credit check, you can get anything you want. I'll stick with my pickup truck, thanks, Clara said, wrinkling her nose. Leon chuckled. Don't blame you at all, he agreed. Now when you hit the interstate, I want you to floor it. You need to put as much distance between you and the cartel as possible. I don't think they're going to follow you, but just in case, you know? She nodded firmly. I won't stop speeding until I hit the Van Horn turnoff, she promised, and then offered him a smile. Good luck. You too, he said, and got out of the truck, smacking the tailgate as he walked around it. As soon as he did so, Clara floored it and tore down the interstate, hopefully to safety. Leon walked in the middle of the road, arms held out to the side to show that he was unarmed. Within a few moments, the car on the other side of the bridge pulled out and raced over to him. 
At first, it picked up a lot of speed, and he wondered for a moment if they would smack into him just for the hell of it. But at the last second, they slammed on the brakes, skidding to a stop five yards away. Yeah, you know not to fuck with me, Leon muttered to himself. That's good. He strolled over to the driver's side window, giving it a casual knock. It was difficult to see inside the extreme tinting job on the windows, but it rolled down after a moment. Two cartel members sat inside, each with several tattoos visible despite being well-dressed in expensive suits. What the fuck you want, man? The driver snapped. And who the fuck was there driving away so quick? Leon raised an eyebrow. Oh, them? He asked offhandedly. They were just making some deliveries. Gotta keep your boss happy after all. Yeah, whatever, man, the driver said with a scowl. What do you want? Leon leaned on the window, propping himself up on his elbows. I need you to get Rodriguez on the line and tell him to get down here ASAP. The men shared a look and then burst into hysterical laughter, the driver even going so far as to slap the steering wheel in his mirth. I say something funny? Leon demanded. Hell yeah, you dim man! The driver gasped through his laughter. The fuck we look like? Your servants or some shit? Leon ran his tongue over his teeth. Nah, you just look like a couple of low men on the totem pole who aren't good enough to get a real job, so you got stuck out here watching us. The driver growled, face quickly turning from amusement to anger. You also look like the type that Tiago Rivas would have no problem gutting like a fish because your idiocy let his empire fall, Leon continued, before either of them could spit back at him. The passenger's brows furrowed in concern and the driver jutted out his chin. What are you talking about, man? he demanded. I know shit you don't, Leon replied gravely. If you don't get Rodriguez down here right now, I'm going to make sure everybody knows you're the reason El Paso falls. Hell, might be worth it just to get a good show of Tiago ripping you to shreds just before everyone dies. The driver looked at his buddy, who shrugged. Neither of them seemed to know what to make of the situation, but the driver finally nodded. Yeah, whatever, man, he said, sounding like he was trying far too hard to sound casual. I'll make the call. He rolled up the window and threw the car in reverse, backing up across the bridge and back to their spot. Leon breathed a sigh of relief as he turned to walk back to the command center, thankful that they hadn't gone rushing after Clara. I think they bought it, he thought to himself. I hope they bought it. Chapter 10 Clara drove past Martha, headed towards the rendezvous spot. She scanned the horizon and spotted an SUV parked on the side of the road, pulling around beside them before hopping out. As she did, three soldiers and Jeff got out to greet her. Man, is it good to see you three again, she said, opening her arms. Hammond grinned as he hugged her. Likewise, he replied. After a round of greetings, she took a step back, and the sergeant crossed his arms. So, what's the word on Marfa? he asked. Clara shook her head. Haven't been yet. I wanted to talk it over with you before making contact, she explained. These guys aren't exactly keen on outsiders. I've been there twice, and they've shot at me both times, so we might not get a friendly welcome. Landry raised his gun. We can handle whatever they throw at us, he declared. Whitaker reached over and smacked the rifle down. We're trying to get their help, not make more enemies, dumbass, she snapped. So... What do you need us to do? Hammond asked Clara. She took a deep breath. I want you to follow me to Marfa, she replied. I'll give you the signal on where to stop. I'm going to have to talk to them first, and hopefully they listen to reason. We'll play it your way, Hammond promised. If there's any trouble, though, we won't leave you hanging. She nodded. I appreciate that, Sergeant, she replied. Come on, let's go. Clara led the mini-caravan down the highway back to town. They pulled off the road, turning onto the main strip through town. When they got a few blocks down, she put her hand out the window to get them to stop, and watched through the rear view as they did. The main portion of town looked the same as it had for weeks. No zombies, no signs of distress, and the cartel-infused barricade at the far end, displaying the corpses of those who dared to cause trouble. As she got close to the barricade, she spotted a few rifle-toting cowboys coming out of the buildings, motioning for her to stop. Clara got out of the truck, hands held high. Clara! Good to see you again, Andrew drawled, 
meeting her in the middle of the road. He leaned over, exaggerating, looking past her to the SUV a few blocks back. Gotta say, though, I am disappointed that on your first visit back you broke our agreement. I said you, and only you, could come here. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't an emergency, she replied. He nodded. Of that, I have no doubt, he said. Still doesn't explain why you broke our agreement. Because I need your help, she insisted. And quite frankly, you need mine as well. There was a ripple of laughter from the others in the group, but Andrew kept a straight face as he held up his hand to quiet down his companions. Now why would we need your help? he asked. She jerked a thumb over her shoulder. Because there is a horde of zombies coming this way, she replied. Bigger than anything we've ever seen. We've handled hordes before, Andrew scoffed, waving a hand at her dismissively. This time won't be any different. She jutted out her chin. What's the biggest horde you've handled? she pressed. A hundred? Five hundred? We had a few hundred wander down from the north a couple weeks back, he replied, voice challenging. Wasn't any big deal. Her gaze turned to steel. There are half a million to a million of those things marching this way, she said. They're going to be here in a matter of days. The amused attitude of the cowboys quickly turned to concern. Bullshit! One of them barked, but Andrew raised his hand again. He took a step forward, studying her face as if to look for deception. I want to make sure I look you in the eye when I ask you this, he said, voice laced with warning. Are you bullshitting me? Or are there really that many of those things headed our way? She stared him level in the eyes. There are at least half a million zombies, quite possibly a million, just to the east of Fort Stockton, she declared. And if we don't help each other, none of us are going to survive. He chewed his lip for a moment and then nodded. What are you proposing? I have an injured man that is in need of shelter, she replied and he immediately rolled his eyes and shook his head. Relax, he was shot a couple of weeks ago in the shoulder, and is still recovering, she insisted. He's not in any danger, but he's also not strong enough to fight. His wife is taking care of him, and they have all the food and medicine they're going to need. Literally, all they need now is a roof over their heads, and a pillow to lay them on. Andrew tongued his cheek and then slowly nodded. We can take them in, he drawled but only until this passes. I can live with that, Clara replied, pressing her palms together. Thank you. He held up a finger. Now, I thought you said you could help us out, he prompted. Doesn't sound like these two are going to be much use. I have some friends I want to introduce you to, she said. He nodded, inclining his head towards the SUV. She turned and gave a powerful whistle before motioning to Hammond to drive up. The cowboys all stiffened, but Andrew waved at them to chill out. The SUV pulled up, and the three soldiers and Jeff got out, sauntering up behind Clara. I'd like you to meet Sergeant Hammond, Private Landry, and Private Whitaker, she said, motioning to her friends. They are a trio of badasses who are going to help you set up defenses for the Horde. She shot Hammond a look, and he understood that he had to back her play, so he smiled and extended a hand. Pleased to meet you he said. Whatever we can do to help defend your town, we're happy to do it while we're here. Andrew crossed his arms, ignoring the offered hand. While you're here, he said, raising an eyebrow, doesn't sound like you're planning on staying very long. A few days at most, the sergeant replied. The cowboy glared at Clara. I hope that just because I look like a cowboy that you aren't assuming I'm a dumb hick, he snapped. Because this, he trailed off, waving a hand at the soldiers, doesn't add up. Hammond sighed. The cartel has one of our men held captive, he explained, holding up his hands in defeat. We're going to use the zombie horde as cover to get into the city and get him out. They're watching Fabin, so we can't go there without risking detection. So we came here. He took a deep breath. Now, if you're not comfortable with us staying with you, we totally understand. We have no problem roughing it out in the wild. God knows we've stayed in worse conditions over the years. We just figured our skills might be of some use to you and yours. 
so we thought we'd offer. Andrew appraised him, nodding thoughtfully. Thank you for your honesty, he drawled. And if it's as bad as you say it is, we could certainly use your help. He glanced at Jeff. And what about you, big fella? That's Jeff, Clara piped up, and he's coming with me. Fair enough, Andrew replied. So, any idea when we can expect the horde to get to us? She tilted her head back and forth. Our best guess at the moment is two and a half days, she replied. Could be longer if we manage to slow them down. Okay, we'll approach it like that's our timeline, the cowboy replied. Anything we get on top of that is gravy. He glanced at Hammond. If you don't mind, I'll ride with you up to Fort Davis. The sergeant nodded. We certainly have the room, he replied. Whenever you're ready. The soldiers headed back to the SUV, and Jeff wandered over to the truck to get into the passenger seat, leaving Clara with the cowboys. Does the cartel know that we're in Fort Davis? Andrew asked. She shook her head. Only our ally in the cartel ranks, she replied. We had to tell him where we got the body. Okay, I'd like to keep it that way, he warned. Understood, Clara replied with a nod. I'll come back here and let you know what the plan is, once we have one, that is. I assume we're going to try and stop them at Fort Stockton, but I don't know the specifics. He took a deep breath. Okay, I'm going to be pulling my men from here since it sounds like we're going to need all hands on deck, he explained, and pointed to the building on the corner. That building there. I'm going to leave a radio set up and make sure it's monitored 24-7 on my end. When you know something, that's how you reach us. When I know, you'll know, she promised. He nodded and headed for the SUV, leaving Clara to hop into the driver's seat of the truck. So, do we know how bad it is yet? Jeff asked as she turned around. She nodded, jaw tight. It's bad enough to make me wonder if we're going to survive it. Chapter 11 Leon sat at the satellite computer, saving images of the horde, while Rufus leaned over his shoulder, watching him work. Man, if we had this kind of stuff back when I was in the military, the older man drawled. Well, it probably wouldn't have done as much good since all they'd see is trees. Leon nodded. Yeah, I've heard some real horror stories about Nam from some of the old-timers. Rufus clucked his tongue playfully. Not saying you're an old-timer, Leon gushed, eyes wide. Just, you know. I'm just joshing you, man, Rufus replied, grinning wide. I know I'm an old fuck. Leon chuckled, shaking his head. You said it, not me. They shared a laugh, and then Rufus sighed. Yeah, that jungle was a bitch, he admitted. Of course, it doesn't sound like the desert was much better. Leon wrinkled his nose. At least we didn't have to worry about the trees talking before opening fire, he replied. This is true, Rufus said with a nod. Sparks sat by the window and perked up as an SUV pulled up and a lone man got out. We got company, she called. Rogers rushed over to the window, looking out and breathing a sigh of relief when he recognized Rodriguez. We're good, the detective said. It's just him. Sparks raised an eyebrow. Would it be bad if it wasn't? she asked. He's the one who spared me and the only one in the cartel to know I'm alive, Rogers explained. It's probably best we keep it that way. Sparks nodded as he went over to the open door, and Rodriguez strolled in. I hope that you have good news for me, he declared, but somehow I doubt it. Ethel appeared with a cup of fresh coffee, holding it out to the cartel member. Here you go, sweetie she said with a smile. At least your visit will start out well. He returned her smile and took the mug. Thank you, ma'am, he said politely. She winked at him and headed off back to her desk. As soon as she had her back turned, his smile dropped, and he turned to Rogers with a stoic expression. So, why am I here? he asked. The detective led Rodriguez over to the computer, and Leon brought up a tight shot of the horde that covered the entire screen. What am I looking at? Rodriguez asked, raising an eyebrow. Rogers took a deep breath. Zombies, and a lot of them, he replied. On the interstate, and marching our way. Looks like we can handle them, Rodriguez replied with a shrug. 
Leon pulled back the camera, bringing up a wide shot showing the entire length of the horde. Rodriguez froze mid-sip of coffee, eyes widening. How many, and how soon? he breathed. Half a million to a million, Leon replied. They'll be on us in five and a half days. Half a day later, they'll be in El Paso. Rodriguez sat back on the desk, staring down into his cup of coffee in silence. After several moments, Rufus cleared his throat. So, is he a great thinker, or did we break his mind? he asked. A little of both, I'm afraid, Rodriguez admitted, swirling the hot brew in his mug. I don't believe we're acquainted, he said, looking at the older man. This is Rufus, and that over there is Sparks, Leon introduced, motioning to the duo. They are some friends of ours from the other side of Fort Stockton. And the only reason we know about the incoming horde, Rogers added. Rodriguez took a deep breath. Are you capable? he asked. We started out in Austin and made it here, Sparks replied dryly, leaving more than a few who doubted us rotting in our wake. The cartel member smirked. I like you, he said, wagging a finger at her. And more importantly, I believe you. He took a thoughtful sip of his coffee and then began to pace back and forth. So, what are your ideas? he finally asked. I assume you have some. Our first thought was to load everybody up in the vehicles we have in town and just move north, Rogers suggested. Rodriguez shook his head. Tiago will never allow that to happen, he replied. He lets you exist because you bring him alcohol, and because knowing he can wipe you out on a whim amuses him. There are standing orders to eliminate anyone who attempts to leave this place outside of normal supply runs. So much for that idea, Leon muttered. Rodriguez looked around the quiet room. Is that it? he asked incredulously. You brought me out here to ask if you could run away? No, we have another request, Sparks piped up, getting to her feet. By all means, he replied, waving for her to speak. We need to know where Mathis is, she explained and we need your help getting the others inside the city so he can be rescued. He blinked at her in amazement. Normally I live by the creed of anything for a woman, especially a pretty one, he said. But what you ask, I'm afraid, is a bit much. What if we could make it worth your while? Rufus inquired. Rodriguez shot the old man a sly smile. I'm intrigued at what you think you can offer me, he said. Well... It seems to me that we have a common enemy in Tiago Rivas, Rufus continued. You help them get in, get Mathis back, and they take care of our mutual problem. Rodriguez chuckled. Well, my friend, I don't know if you are aware, but we've already tried that plan once, he said, and took a loud slurp of his coffee. Didn't work out so well for anyone involved, especially for poor Mathis. Do you have any brothers, Rodriguez? Rufus asked. The cartel member's brows furrowed in confusion. Yes, a younger one, he replied. Why the sudden interest in my family? To make a point about not giving up, Rufus replied. Your mother obviously knew she fucked up, so she tried again and had your brother. Leon, Sparks, and Rogers all gaped at the brash old man with wide eyes. There was a tense moment of silence before Rodriguez threw his head back and laughed setting his mug down on the desk to avoid spilling it. You have spirit, old man, he finally said, shaking his head. I respect that, he sighed, sobering a little. But this is still a tall order. We're already facing down a million zombies, Leon cut in. Might as well go for broke. Rodriguez took a deep breath, tilting his head back and forth. Getting Tiago out of the way would make all our lives easier, he agreed. I am not in favor of this plan, yet. I will give it some thought, and if I feel as though I have a viable plan that can be enacted, I will give it my blessing. That's all we can ask for, Rogers said. But now, back to our most pressing issue, the Horde, Rodriguez continued, raising his palms. When I inform Tiago of this, he will have El Paso locked up tight, so the concern is for you, now. I think I can convince him to lend some supplies, and quite possibly some help in protecting the town, but it will be difficult. What if we raise the stakes? Sparks piped up, crossing her arms. Make the situation seem more dire than it really is. Rodriguez raised an eyebrow. 
I don't think his reaction will change if we tell him there are two million zombies instead of just a million, he mused. Spark shook his head. Wrong thing to exaggerate, she replied. If we tell him the truth that we have six days before they reach El Paso, he's not going to care about us, because that's more than enough time to secure the city. However, if we tell him that they'll be here in two days, we might be able to convince him to send help. Tell him if he sends men that we'll be able to slow them down and buy them more time to prepare. Rodriguez thought about it a moment, and then picked up his mug again, taking a long sip before nodding. If we play it like this, we might be able to convince him, he agreed. It would also open up opportunities to smuggle the others into the city so they can take another shot. Tell him we need Angel to help, Rogers said suddenly. Leon shook his head. I know you have a score to settle, but... Damn right I have a score to settle, the detective cut in. And this may be the only time I'm going to be able to do it. Rodriguez pursed his lips. It's risky, but having him out of the way will make it easier for me to seize control of the cartel once Tiago has been eliminated. He agreed, and nodded. I will do what I can. All I can ask, Rogers replied. Okay, Rodriguez said, setting his empty mug on the desk. I should go speak with Tiago, telling him we have two days they are on us. Assuming he agrees, I will be back at first light with men and supplies. What do you need from us? Leon asked. An inventory of what you have between equipment, supplies, and people, Rodriguez replied, counting off on his fingers. Having some course of action for how to slow the horde could be of some use as well. We'll be ready, Rogers promised. Well, they'll be ready, since I'll be in hiding. Rodriguez raised an eyebrow. Are you leaving town? he asked. The detective shook his head. Wouldn't dream of it. The cartel member nodded at him and inclined his head over to Ethel. Wonderful, as always, ma'am, he called. Thank you for the hospitality. Any time, she replied, waving a hand at him. Now you be safe out there. He nodded and headed out of the command center. As he got in the SUV and drove off, Sparks turned away from the window and crossed her arms. So now what? she asked. Leon took a deep breath. Well, we already have a pretty good inventory of what we have in town, so we're good there, he replied. Any chance I can take a look at it? Rufus asked. Oh, sure, Rogers replied with a nod. Ethel? I got the file at my house, she replied. I'll be back with it in a few minutes. Or if you all just want to come on by in half an hour or so, I can feed you a hot meal. Well, that's what we're doing, Rufus declared. Leon chuckled. Guess we have our plan, then, he said. We'll see you there, Ethel. She waved and headed out as Leon began to shut down the computer. Wait, Sparks said, walking up to him. Can you pull up Fort Stockton? she asked. He nodded and zeroed in on the image, showing the entire city. She studied it before looking around on the desk for a pen and paper. She grabbed a pencil and started sketching out the city. When he gave her a side eye, she glanced at him. I figure this is going to be our first opportunity to break up the horde, she explained. Gotta know what our options are. Leon stood up. I think we have a road map of it somewhere, he replied. I'll track it down. He spotted Rufus and Rogers by the door and waved at them. Rogers, why don't you give Rufus a nickel tour of the town? He might have some ideas on how to defend it. Maybe grab Trenton while you're at it. We'll meet you at Ethel's in a bit. The detective nodded and the two men headed out the door. Leon and Sparks turned back to their paperwork, everyone somber with the weight of the threat on their shoulders. Chapter 12 With the comforting noises of Ethel cooking in the kitchen, the smells even better, Rufus and Rogers sat by the fire in the living room sipping cans of soda. The older man poured over a notebook filled with handwritten notes of the inventory of the town, while Trenton, Sparks, and Leon sat at the dining room table, studying several maps. So, what do you think? Rogers asked. Can we make some good stuff with what we have here? Rufus nodded. Oh yeah, we're going to have some fun, he replied. Just off the top of my head, with what I'm seeing on the list, I can make seventeen redneck rattlers, four backwood butchers, and one humdinger. Rogers raised an eyebrow. I'm going to assume that will cause a fair amount of damage, he said slowly. Rufus nodded. Oh, yeah, 
especially the humdinger, he replied with a grin. Hell, they might even hear it in El Paso. His eyes lit up. Wait, can I have one of the buses? When it comes to defending this town, you can have whatever you need, Rogers replied with a nod, and then paused. But I'm guessing we wouldn't be getting the bus back once you're done with it. Rufus chuckled. Lord, no, he drawled. I mean, a few pieces might land here in town, but it's not going to be operational. This is going to be a hell of an adventure, Rogers said with a sigh. But even with that kind of force, it's not going to make much of a dent in a horde that size, is it? I mean, if I pack it perfectly, we could probably take out a thousand or so with it, the older man replied. But I was thinking of using it as a diversion. How so? the detective asked. Rufus leaned forward. Well, we know those things come off the interstate and infest the exits, he said. My thought is that we have somebody stationed with the humdinger a mile or so up the road north of here. We wait until the main group wanders by, then set it off. In theory, the noise should attract the zombies in town here and lure them into the desert. Don't we risk turning around the main group if we do that? Rogers asked. The older man contemplated for a moment, rubbing his chin. That's a concern, he admitted. But I think if we let him get a couple miles up the road before detonating it, the trickle back will be negligible. All right, Rogers agreed. We'll start setting it up first thing in the morning, along with the town defenses. Rufus raised a finger. I had some thoughts on that too, he said. How attached are you to those bridges over the rainwater channel? Rogers chuckled. Looks like we might get to break out the jackhammer, he said. Hey, boys, before you get too crazy with the town defenses, Sparks piped up, turning around in her seat. Can you brainstorm some ideas on how to slow down the horde? Not only do we need the time, but we need to put on a good show for the cartel since we're telling a blatant lie to Tiago. The boys exchanged a look and shrugged, but nodded. Satisfied, Sparks turned back towards the table of maps. I'm guessing you don't need all the cars in town? Rufus asked. Rogers shook his head. Not unless you want to start crazy Rufus's used car lot once we survive this, he joked. Nah, but I wouldn't mind saving a few just in case we come across a monster truck. The older man quipped. Always been on my bucket list to crush some smaller cars with a bigger one. The detective laughed. I like the way you think, he said. But what do you want to do with the cars? A flaming rag in the gas tank combined with a brick on the accelerator and you have yourself a rolling IED, Rufus explained. Smack them into the crowd and let it go boom. Shrapnel should take out some, but the resulting fire should hit even more. Rogers clapped his hands together and sat forward, eyes lighting up. Oh, hell yeah, he exclaimed. I almost forgot about our flamethrowers. You have flamethrowers? Rufus cried. Oh, we're gonna have some fun. They jabbered on quickly with excitement, and Sparks shook her head, stifling a smile before focusing back on the map of Fort Stockton. She and Leon had written several notes on the map, highlighting potential choke points for the marching horde. The center of town was circled with a bright red line curving around the northern edge. There were two black X's, one on the east side and one on the northern side. Leon pointed to the former. So, the highway runs straight through the center of town before cutting up to the northwest, he said. My concern about breaking some of the main horde off here is that we still have a significant group on the highway in the middle of town. What happens when the two of them meet? Sparks pursed her lips for a moment and then leaned forward. If we pull enough of them off of the interstate and onto the highway, it should be enough to force the stationary ones to get moving in the right direction, she suggested. Plus, if we can pull that off, they'll walk right under the interstate here. She drew an axe on the northwest side of town. The noise and movement might pull more of those things off of the main group. Now it's going to be risky pulling them from the interstate here, because whoever does that is essentially going to be trapped in the middle. So they're going to have to get out of the way and hide. I can handle that, Trenton said, raising his hand. Somebody is going to have to come pick me up afterwards, however. What? You don't want to hitchhike back? Leon asked with a smirk. Trenton rolled his eyes. Really? he asked. You want to picture me showing a little leg to get a truck to pull off the interstate? Leon wrinkled his nose. 
consider the question withdrawn, he declared, and chuckles rippled around the table. He focused on the X at the top of the map, tapping his finger on it. So, you think we can pull some off here too? he asked. Don't see why not, Sparks replied with a shrug. We'll just have multiple teams for both diversion points. This group is going to have a bit of a wait, because they'll have to speed up and duck down one of these rural roads and wait them out. So if you're on that team, bring a book, because it's going to be a long day. Trenton raised an eyebrow. What about pulling them south? he asked. Too big of a risk, Leon replied, shaking his head. The highway south runs right into the highway that leads to Morpha. Not only that, but it keeps on going straight into Van Horn, which kind of defeats the purpose of diverting them. These other two target highways just keep going to the north, so they'll either get lost in the desert or they'll be someone else's problem. You think we should send someone ahead to warn them? Sparks asked, taking a deep breath. Just in case people are there? Leon tilted his head back and forth. I think with our track record of meeting new people, that would be a risky venture, he admitted. Still, if we have enough support from Rodriguez and the cartel, it could be worthwhile. There was a knock at the door, and then it opened. Hello, Clara called. Ethel, you come on in, sweetie, and have a seat, the old woman trilled as she emerged from the kitchen. Dinner will be ready in just a minute. She spotted Jeff behind her and smiled. And don't you worry, big boy. I made enough for you, too. He blinked at her in confusion and then smiled. Thank you, ma'am. It go okay in Marfa? Rogers asked, standing up to address Clara. Yeah, it took a little convincing, but they took everybody in, she replied. All they ask is that we don't let the cartel know that they are there, and we give them a heads up with the timetable for everything. Doesn't seem too unreasonable, Rogers agreed. All right now. Ethel said firmly as she entered the dining room carrying a tray of steaming hot biscuits. Let's get this work cleared away. Enough has been done for one day. Sparks and Leon cleared away the maps and set them on the side table. Rogers and Rufus leaned over their inventory again, and Ethel waved another mitt at them. Detective, she snapped, I'm not going to ask you again. Rogers chuckled and snatched the book from Rufus, setting it on the table. We'd better listen to her, he said. Yeah, she seems like someone we'd want to stay on the good side of, Rufus said. Good to see you retain some intelligence in your old age there, mister, Ethel said primely. Now, you boys get over here and get a plate. She disappeared into the kitchen as everyone gathered around the large table, coming back out with two large serving dishes of vegetables. A moment later, she reappeared with a gigantic casserole dish and set it down in the middle. She took a seat at the head of the table as everyone piled up their plates and folded her hands in front of her. It warms my heart to see everyone at this table tonight, she said, smiling widely. Old friends and new alike, enjoying a peaceful evening together. Reminds me of all the kinds of Sunday evenings my family would have over the years. Events like these have been few and far between of late and I fear as though they are going to be even rarer in the weeks ahead. So for the rest of the night, we aren't thinking about tomorrow, or the day after that. We are only thinking of today, enjoying each other's company. We're going to tell stories of our lives before. We're going to laugh until we cry. And if anybody mentions the last month, they're really going to cry once I'm done with them. There was laughter around, and she raised her chin. Thank you all for being here with me this evening, she said. Now dig in, before it gets cold. I worked hard on this. More chuckling, and then everyone dug into their meals, enjoying the home cooking from the wonderful, friendly woman. The group ate together and sat around the table for hours, swapping stories of life before the apocalypse. Sparks impressed the group by telling them about the time she defeated the Dudek brothers for the championship belt even reenacting the cowbell takedown for an overly excited Rufus. Leon, Rufus, and Rogers spun tales of their times in their respective services. Jeff even told the story of how he got the scar on his back from a hardcore punk show. For a brief moment in time, everything seemed normal. Eventually, Leon disappeared, emerging from the kitchen with a tray of glasses and a brown bag. Can I have everyone's attention? he asked and everyone stopped chattering to look up at him. Now, 
I know Ethel said we aren't allowed to talk about the present, but I'm hoping she'll allow a quick exception, he said, throwing her an apologetic look. Now, we have risked life and limb over the last month, not only to survive, but to secure high-quality tequila for Juan Tiago Rivas. There was some playful booing from the table, and he held up his hands to calm them down. Those missions are thankfully at an end, he continued, because no matter the outcome of this week, either Tiago won't be a problem for us, or we won't be around to care. So, with that in mind, I'd like to propose a toast. He reached into the bag and pulled out one of the expensive bottles of tequila, showing it off. He popped it open to cheers and started pouring glasses, sending them down the table from hand to hand. I figure it's time to see what all the fuss is about this stuff, don't you? He asked, and everyone raised their glasses. To us, he declared. To Reed, Clara added. To Mathis, Trenton said. Rogers took a deep breath. To our friends who aren't with us right now, he said. Everyone raised their glasses higher, and Ethel smacked a hand on the table. And fuck Tiago Rivas, she declared. Everyone laughed and cheered, clinking glasses and then downing the tasty shots. One last big gesture of fun and happiness before the biggest battle for their lives would begin. The End Up next the group heads to Fort Stockton to begin the Herculean task of slowing down the horde of zombies marching their way in El Paso, Creeping Death Part 2. <laughs>